Hello, everything you ever wanted to know about the ship's galley. That's what we're discussing this week, aren't we, Elizabeth? Yes, except for actual recipes. I think yeah. we're going to cover everything off, aren't we? Yes, we're going to cover everything from uh, provisioning to storing your food and, and how we cook our food as well, all the different implements. This was a very popular request on our Discord channel. We put a shout out for podcast ideas and a few people came back, including uh, Rob Benfanati, who says... We have one of the most accessorised galleys in the world. He lives on a catamaran, by the way. He has a bread maker, electric pressure cooker, double air fryer. Didn't know there was such a thing. Uh, um, what else has he got? An oven, induction, and even an ice cream maker. He is... must have an enormous battery, is all I can say. <laughs> yeah. he, is, uh, he does have Italian origins. He says, he, my Italian origins are demanding. But anyway, he says... He's keen to listen to tricks, especially about conservation and storage. And he's finding that uh, their veggies aren't lasting as long because they tend to store them in the hanging nets, which is one of the traditional ways of storing your fruit and veg. Yeah. And uh, Nautic Hunt, also on Discord, wants to know about induction versus gas, which is something we know a lot about. And special contraptions like pressure cookers and <laughs> eco pots. And do you really need an oven if you have a barbecue? And do we have any experience with solar cookers? So just from those two people, there are a lot of interesting questions there. And I think it's important to emphasise that a well-fed crew is a happy crew. It's so, so important. I live from one meal to the next. <laughs> I'm planning them in my head and thinking about them the next day. Um, enjoy. Uh, shopping and finding new food yeah yeah so in this podcast what we're going to do is sort of we'll, we'll try and break it down in the order in which you would do things good so we're going to start off with the fun uh side of provisioning how you actually source all your food when you live remotely on a boat uh, then we're going to talk about how we store our food and then finally we'll have a look at all the different implements that we use or you could use once you're in your galley um, talking of galley, I guess we should talk about just very quickly the history of the word galley. Yes, I see you did a little tiny bit of research. A Tell me about it. Tiny bit of research. Hello, I'm Liz. And I'm Jamie. Welcome to Follow the Boat, in which we discuss what it's really like to give it all up to live on a boat. And go travelling around the world. We've been doing it since 2006 and we're still at it. Each week we talk about our latest YouTube video. And about boats, sailing, travel or anything else which floats into our heads. And if you leave a comment we like, we'll give you an answer and a name check. Peace, Peace and, and fair, fair winds. So a galley originally was actually a type of uh, low-lying, I think a trade boat that was used in the Mediterranean. But this was eons ago. This was hundreds and many hundreds of years ago. But the word galley, to mean kitchen on a boat, didn't come about until about 1750. Right. Uh, I can't quite work out the actual origin of when it switched, but it, it was around about that time. So it's a word that's been used to mean kitchen on a boat for many years. But of course, they are slightly different to what we are used to on land. So kitchens and galleys, they're you know, you hear a lot of yachts called their galley a kitchen. They're doing it wrong, it's called a galley. <laughs> <laughs> and that they are slightly different. Well, basically, the definition of a galley is um, it's your cooking area and storage area for your food that lies down one side of the boat. Mm. So all your cupboards are on either the port side or the starboard side of the boat. They're not forward. You don't have cupboards at the end facing forwards or backwards. But you do get some square galleys, don't you? You do, yes. And I think this is mainly for your storage of your food and your utensils and um, what have you. They're all stored down one side of the boat. And I guess it's just because of the way that a boat moves when it's at sea. A uh, little bit safer to have them all stored uh, facing into the boat yeah. rather than either end. OK, so that's the theory. I have to say, though, we went on a big oyster. Remember John and Cheryl's oyster? And they did have, of course, it was big enough storage either side like she mm. had the fridge on one side storage on the other side so it's kind of a moot point really but um, we like the long thin galley which is what we've got because it gives you so much room to brace when you're really healing and you know, yeah life's I, I, difficult and i think that's quite an important thing is just to sort of discuss very quickly what makes a good galley versus mm. a bad galley and as you say for us having that tight space sounds a bit counterintuitive but when you're at sea you really do want to lock yourself in you yeah. don't want to be thrown around so I guess even if you've got an L-shaped galley as long as you've got 
uh, a small enough space to be able to grab onto things as the boat moves around is the important thing. Yes, it really is. Yeah. Um, high fiddles, yeah. fiddles being the uh, the sides to your countertop, so yeah. nice and high. So if the boat heals, you know, your plate of food doesn't slide off onto the floor. And that's true of pretty much all shelves and surfaces around any seagoing boat. You have to have blocks at the end of the shelves, otherwise things just fall straight off. It's annoying when you're in an anchorage and when you're flat because you can't just sort of dust things off. <laughs> mm. But uh, it does hold stuff there, it's really, really important. Uh, and a gimbaled stove, oven top, whatever it is you're doing your cooking on, absolutely cannot live without a gimbal. Yes, very important. And, and actually, if you can lock your gimbal off when you are in a marina, that's also useful yes. because it's also annoying trying to fry things on the counter, to, on the stove top and it swings backwards and forwards. But yes. I've been on boats that don't have gimbaled uh, stoves and <laughs> really? they are a pain in the bum. That's so wrong. Yeah, yeah. It, just, it just doesn't work. I think also uh, to have a cage around the, um, the top of the stove. Yes, yeah, so we have that. So as well as the gimbal, as well as it keeping the, the stuff straight, if there is a sudden movement, that, cage, that bar that we've got just stops the pots from falling off doesn't it it's really yeah cool. and, and some some cookers will also have uh sort of wire uh fiddles as well i suppose that you can move backwards and forwards so you put your saucepan yeah. on top and then you yeah. can you can move these uh wire holders in place so that it keeps the pot in place when you're moving around yeah so it's all about securing um the cooking apparatus whether it's a saucepan frying pan whatever um so that you don't get scalded and it doesn't jump out and hit you in bad weather. So we had a tailor's stove when we first came on the boat, which had all of that, mm. um, and it was a great. It was really, it was a really good cooker. They, of course, the whole stove, something like that, they are expensive. They are very expensive, and mm. we uh, switched, and we'll talk about that in a bit yes. more detail uh, in a moment. And uh, we came up with a much cheaper solution, didn't we? <laughs> a much cheaper. Right, okay, so now we know what a galley is. Let's get on to the fun stuff. This is the bit you're itching to talk about. Well, provisioning, or more colloquially, shopping, basically. <laughs> we like to use our special words, don't we, on boats? But yeah, but provisioning, is just, it's, it's shopping for all the bits for the boats, but we're specifically talking about galley provisioning here, so not oil and everything else. Um, pr provisioning... Shopping doesn't sound as though it's that complicated, but of course there's the physical problem of getting on or off the boat when you're at anchor and having to take everything across water on a dinghy. Well, that's, How do you do all of that? <laughs> yeah. there's, there's all of that. Um, and there's also the problem sometimes you're in places that are very remote or completely foreign to you with selling foods that you don't understand. So it's, it can be a bit of a challenge if you when you start out. If you're thinking about doing this and thinking, well, how on earth do you provision somewhere like Indonesia? I've never been. I don't know what they eat. Where do you go? What do you do? So yeah. That is always fun. Well, I think, you know, from that point of view, you just flip it on its head and you make this new experience into a fun experience. Yes. And make a little adventure out of it. I mean, we love going to local markets. And I guess we should just break down, first of all, when we're provisioning, where we get our food sources from. So let's talk about Local markets first. Yeah, so in the smaller places, uh, there's no such thing as a supermarket. There will be a bloke carrying stuff on the back of a bicycle, mm -hmm. or there might be um, like a little carriage that he's got, stacked little cart full of stuff, and he'll come round once or twice a day around the village. And in slightly bigger villages, they will actually have markets, usually one day a week, sometimes yeah. every morning. And I think the advantage of shopping this way is that the food is guaranteed to be fresh. Yeah. And you'll be paying local prices as well. Yes. It's generally a lot cheaper to shop this way. Yeah. So ignore the people who'll tell you that they'll they'll charge you the tourist price. Well, they will in places like Bali in the tourist areas, but in all the other far off the beaten track remote areas, you just pay what the locals do mm. and they'll help you and they'll select for you. They'll bend over backwards. They'll be so excited to meet you. Sometimes they forget to charge you, so you have to pay them. <laughs> um, so yeah, lovely and cheap, lovely and fresh. But it's a great way also to discover new foods. Quite often mm. you go to these local markets and you'll see a, 
a group of mainly women sort of all fluttering around a particular fruit or vegetable that you've never seen before. Mm. So the trick is to buy it. Yes. And if you've got internet connection, go back and research how to cook it. Or better still, ask one of the local people how to cook it. Yes, if you can get through the language barrier, um, that's the best way. They'll tell you quickly what to do. We, we started doing that in India, didn't we? Mm. So we would go into the... I mean, the, the fruit and veg in India was like nowhere else. Mm. It was just extraordinary. 50 different types of banana you know, yes. um, and mango and whatever. So we would just buy stuff and bring it home and then we'd look it up and work out how to, how to cook it. Uh, and I love doing that. We've learned so much doing mm. that. The other interesting thing about uh, sourcing your food locally is that it's all seasonally dependent. Yeah. So you're only buying the foodstuffs that are grown locally or maybe perhaps imported uh, from within its own country mm. because in Indonesia you'll find different islands specialise in different fruit and veg and spices mm. so your diet becomes seasonal as well we found this especially true in Turkey didn't we oh certainly yeah and you look for certain times of the year when the big tomatoes came in over in India it's when the mangosteen season mm. in Thailand for me it was um oh gosh what was oh various fruits <laughs> coming out but yeah very much so so that's uh, that's local villages that's, and markets yeah so that's local on land but yeah there's also local on sea as yeah. well which of course is passing fishermen yeah and uh we've uh, we've been given and it's mainly given or mm. perhaps bartered uh, fresh fish which has just been caught or jimmy jimmy which is squid mm. um, we've had fish lobbed at us by passing fishermen in bags you know just thrown at us yeah and uh, I think the most important thing with getting food off fishermen is to make sure that they're not sourcing it from a fish farm, which can happen, especially around the Phuket area in Thailand. There's a lot of fish farms and we were finding that the fishermen were getting their fish from the fish farms mm -hmm. and then, you know, hiking up the price a little and selling it to the boats at anchor. So just, you know, we, we try to avoid farms fish if we can. We do. We, I mean, we obviously we fish ourselves. So that's, that's a whole other topic. We've done a whole video on that. So catch your own fish is just fantastic mm. but uh yeah in um the red sea we were offered two beautiful lobsters do you remember oh yes uh, on er in, in eritrea by some very bedraggled fishermen who looked extremely poor and they held up these stunning lobsters and so we said yeah we'll have those they didn't want money but did we have a cigarette well we had taken some cigarettes with us so we gave them some cigarettes some t-shirts an old jacket of mine a whole load of stuff and so it was bar uh, true bartering. Yeah. And sugar was the other thing they wanted. Oh, and the other thing is snorkel masks. Yes, over uh, here we've them, done that. Yeah, in Indonesia, they do like snorkel masks. So yeah. just carry a whole load of stuff that you may not need yeah. or finished with and just be prepared to relinquish those for some very tasty, fresh fish. Yeah, don't throw it away. It's always, someone will have it. Yeah. Um, I've got down here for mm, yes. foraging, and I think this is quite an interesting one because it is perfectly feasible to forage for your food in these places, and you will see local people foraging. Yes. I mean, I'm thinking back again to our times in Turkey. I don't think I've ever eaten so many fresh figs mm. as Turkey because mm. fig trees are growing all over the countryside, mm. uh, not always in people's gardens. And um, you can literally pluck them from the tree and eat them fresh. Mm. And you remember when we were in Thailand uh, doing our refit, we lived a few doors down from a local lady, who, Pen, Pen mm. um, who uh, would come in um, and walk through our our place that we were living in she'd just help herself walk through the open front door through our living room and out into the back garden and start foraging <laughs> leaves off the trees and then a few hours later you'd go and eat in her restaurant and there are the leaves that she had foraged for. and it was so tasty she mm. tried to explain to me a few things and i tried to pick up a few things but um it's a real art to go foraging there are books written on it obviously it's different in different countries but you learn the local thing the other thing in turkey was fresh sage which grew all over the mountains mm. you could just pick the sage and sage tea is a really big thing in turkey i loved that yeah. and of course recently we've just shown the curry leaves here that's right yeah um supermarkets sorry uh, we'll talk about supermarkets in a minute i was just going to say restaurants uh actually are quite a good place to uh, get your perhaps hard to source foods and i'm thinking in particular when we were in on one island tierman wasn't it yeah where we couldn't get cheese. We could get lots of duty-free booze, yes. but we couldn't get cheese. We went to a restaurant uh, one evening and we just happened to get chatting to the uh, the head waiter about cheese. And he said, well, I'll, wait a minute, I'll go and have a chat with my 
chef in the... Yeah, because they had a great cheese board. That's I think right. that's why it came up, wasn't yeah. it? It was Tierman, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. And uh, the chef came out and said, what cheese would you like? Oh, I don't know, fancy a bit of Stilton if you can get hold of it. Well, next day he came back with a whole barrel, didn't we? We had, we had two or three huge cheeses. Yeah. Gosh, it was so great. But people really love talking to you about food. And if you tell them, they'll... We've had people saying, oh, well, the chef's going off to town tomorrow. What would you like? Mm. And they'll do the shopping for you. Mm. Yeah, make friends. Use the local people. They love and want to help out. So I just mentioned supermarkets. Obviously, yeah. that, that's an obvious one. And um, th this is... I think supermarkets are really good for when you're provisioning for a long uh, offshore journey or perhaps even just you're going out to anchor for a couple of weeks at a time so you get to the supermarket and of course you can buy things in bulk i think that's the that's the main reason for going for supermarkets yeah you can get it? your basics like you know you can get your flour and your sugar and uh, all Toil those things toilet paper toilet paper all yeah. that sort of stuff if there is a supermarket so there's one decent supermarket here on lombok and uh, wherever you are, you can somehow get transport there and do your big shop there. Sometimes there is no supermarket. So when you do find one that's got everything, perhaps got expat type things like Marmite, yeah. then uh, absolutely use that as a way to really bulk up your cupboards. Yeah, we find uh, in certainly in Indonesia, a lot of the, ex, ex, we'll call it expat food, uh, yeah. is, is Australian. So yes. you get a lot of the jams. Uh, Vegemite, obviously, uh, honey, that kind of thing tends to come from Australia and cheeses as well. Yes, although the local honey is the one I prefer here. You know, sometimes they get the wild honey out of the trees. Well, you have to be a bit careful with honey mm. here because there is also a cheap version of the honey, which is basically like a sugar syrup. Mm. So um, if you buy your honey, always ask and the, the locals would be honest and say to them, is this proper honey mm. or is this sugar infused honey? The giveaway is the price. If it's cheap, it's not real honey because yes. even here in Indonesia, good honey is not the cheapest thing. Supermarkets, of course, are very hard to come by, uh, especially as you travel to more remote places. And invariably, if you're a tanker, it will require transportation. Yeah. And in this uh, instance here, while we're in Lombok, if we want to provision in the big supermarket, it's a whole day out. Yeah, so what we do is tend to, I mean, you can hire cars over here, much more difficult, in India, impossible. If you find this topic interesting and would like to continue the conversation, come and join the Follow the Boat Discord community. Look for the link in the description. It's free. Sorry, we just had to pause there <laughs> for a passing boat. And actually that boat is one of the water transportation yeah. boats. So if you think it's difficult provisioning from a boat, think about these poor guys who have to have all their drinking water imported. Yeah, there's no water source on the island, so mm. they have to bring, bring it all over. Anyway, I'll just finish my point. So it was about um, um, getting around the shops. If you're on your own, for instance, quite often I'll do the shopping on my own. We, I'll hire a car with a driver, which sounds expensive, but it's not in this part of the world. And it just makes life so much easier. You get out, you do your shopping, dump it in the back, and then you can go off to, to two or three places all over Matran, which is the main city here. You get so much done in one day. So that is an option. It is also very exhausting. <laughs> yes, it is. It's, it's, a uh, it's a long day. OK, so you've got all your food from the locals or from the supermarket or from the restaurant, and you've somehow got it back to the boat we won't go into that you can discover that joy for yourself if you've never done it before but you get your stuff back to the boat so i guess the next thing we need to talk about is how we store the food yes and the shelf life of the food depends a lot on various factors so yeah and storage and shelf life come, uh, come together so, um yeah, yeah. Go on. so what, what, what i did in the notes was to break, yeah. break down shelf life by uh short shelf life so that's less than a week yeah uh, medium which is a week to a month and then uh longer and then indefinite yes so, uh elizabeth you're the expert on this let's talk about food that has a shelf life of less than a week yeah so it's, it's probably fairly obvious that things like lettuce and very fine green leaves that kind of thing they don't last as long as anything else. Even in the fridge, they're quite difficult. I mean, I've managed to keep things like coriander, fresh coriander going for a week or around about a week. Sometimes it's gone the next day. Yep. Um, so things like that, fresh herbs, green leaves, soft, soft fruit in nets um, doesn't last that long. We used to use nets a lot, but that was when we were back in Turkey. But in the tropics, I just don't think nets work. They don't work. 
We'll come on to that in a minute yeah, about yeah, yeah. how we actually store those, but uh, it, it is worth bearing in mind there are alternative ways of uh, storing these more delicate foodstuffs. Yeah. Um, so what about medium term? So by this I said sort of between a week to a month. Yeah, so things like um, ginger, root, root ginger, that'll last quite a long time. Most root vegetables last a lot longer than anything else. But so garlic, ginger, they'll last a good month if kept, you know, don't put them in direct sunlight and try and put them in somewhere that's a little bit cooler, but they're pretty hardy things. Carrots, if uh, going into a fridge, can last a month, sometimes only a week, but it's about how you store them, which we'll go on to in a minute. Cabbages last for ages. Mm. They'll last a month easily. Well, I, I mean, I had actually put cabbages <laughs> in more than a month. Yes. You, you, you changed it to a month, but I yeah. know we've had cabbages uh, living in the fridge for more than a month and, yeah. and they're fine you just peel off the outer leaves and yes everything is fine inside it's true again it's, it's about what how you prepare it and how you store it but yeah you can make them last for ages green apples don't ever seem to die so no. they should actually be in longer in the longer one i'd say but green apples are the one fruit that will get you across an ocean mm. um um yeah that's it really cheese obviously well no no, I don't know why. I think you've changed my notes here, but I thought I'd put cheese in more than a month because the longer the cheese sits in the fridge, the taster it becomes. That's if it's wrapped, uh, vacuum wrapped, it'll last a long time. When, once you've opened it, you've got to, you know, I wouldn't say longer than a month because it starts to go a bit funny. I don't know. Yeah. Meat and fish, same, same thing. You can refrigerate it for a certain amount of time, but it will go eventually. And what about longer than a month? Well, your freezer. I mean, obviously that's everything, isn't it? For meat, pre-cooked meals, anything that's frozen, yeah. great. I was thinking more things, uh, your fresh stuff. So, yeah. you know, I'm thinking potatoes and onions in yeah. particular, they do last a long time. Yeah. Uh, depending on how you store them. We'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah, green uh, apples is where the sh these green apples should be here. Yep. Yep. And then indefinite, again, it's quite obvious. It's all your dried stuff. Yeah. So your rices, your pastas, beans, pulses, flour, and of course, herbs and spices as well. Yes, and these are essentials, absolute essentials on a boat, because sometimes you don't know how long you're going to be somewhere, how long something's going to take. So you eat the, uh, the, fir the, you know, the stuff that only lasts a week first, and then you gradually work down till all you've got left is you know, either frozen stuff or dried stuff. But you'd, you'd be surprised what kind of tasty meals you can mm. cook up with literally 90% of it coming from your dry stock. And cans, of course. Yeah. And then maybe the odd vegetable that's either survived in the fridge or you've managed to get ashore from a, a little village. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you can live for, for weeks, if not months, just on yes. the dry stuff. So. I mean, we had loads of canned fish at one stage. We were living off that when we couldn't really get much protein. You could do the same with meat for meat eaters. So, yeah. One of the things that I, I did want to make clear was about this outside temperature thing. So in the temperate climates where it's cooler, there's a lot of things that you can leave, leave outside, like things in nets, like fruit and veg generally. They'll last a lot longer than in the tropics. We've got the high temperature and the humidity here and it, it absolutely destroys everything. Mm. So some of this won't, uh, won't apply to you if you're in a cooler temperature. Yeah, well, if, let's talk about temperatures then, which yeah. le leads us on to fridges and freezers. Yeah. Uh, which are, well, I mean, you know, we know we know plenty of yachts that don't have fridges and freezers. No. In a, it, and of course, they didn't for many hundreds of years. Uh, but as you say, in the tropics, it's kind of important, if for no other reason than to keep your beer and drinks cool. <laughs> yes, which is what you used to do all the time. Yeah. yeah. But the fridges and freezers, they, they, can, they are quite efficient these days, um, certainly more than they used to be. They tend to run off 12 or 24 volt as, as opposed to, to 240. And you can get many different types. So you've got air-cooled fridges, fresh water cooled, uh, which takes water from your uh, drinking water tanks, or salt water cooled, where the pipe goes outside onto the hull and goes through a conduit to keep uh, the motor cool. Um, and they tend to be mounted quite low down and perhaps against the hull of the boat where the seawater is obviously cooler than the ambient uh, air temperature so mm. that helps keep things a little bit cooler um, but they tend to be extremely heavily insulated and uh, these top loading fridges like ours will have fridges that are 
the lids are, you know, they're almost a foot in, <laughs> in depth because they have so much insulation in them. Yeah, so not many boats have the front loaders, do they? They're nearly all top loaders. They are. I mean, we do know people that have domestic fridges, which, and bear in mind, of course, domestic fridges, uh, they're running off the same compressor. So a domestic fridge may plug into 240 or 220 volt or 110 volt system. But actually, it's um, stepping that down to 12 volt to run the compressor, which tends to be a 12 volt compressor. However, they are not as efficient because you are opening the fridge from the side. Mm. And so the cool air escapes Immediately goes. that much more quickly. Yeah, it really does. And also, if you're on a, on a tilt, you can't open the fridge if it's tilting the wrong way because everything will fall out. Unless you've got cages all the way up, I suppose. Absolutely need a lock on yeah. the fridge door. Yeah. And the other thing is storage. You don't get as much storage. You no. can store a lot more in the same dimension box if it's a top loader versus then uh, a side loading fridge. Yeah, you could do a whole podcast on fridges because um, those top loaders are a bugger to use unless you really sort them out and have them organised in boxes, in boxes, in boxes in the fridge. Mm. But they're very efficient. And then, of course, you've got freezers as well. And uh, this is essentially, it's exactly the same as the fridge. Uh, you just dial down the temperature. Uh, to keep things cooler and that's obviously great for meats and fish uh, that kind of thing that will keep things uh, frozen for, for many many months it's also a very good way and i only learned this recently of freezing weevils out mm -hmm. of your yes, food that's right. yeah, 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 yeah. so rice in particular if you vacuum pack that and chuck it in a freezer, I think for about up to five days, it will kill all the weevil. Okay. Eggs. But we'll talk a bit more about yeah. weevils. And if you don't know what a weevil is, they are the bane <laughs> of the ship's chef. Yeah, they're everywhere. They're <laughs> all over this part of the world. Uh, the other thing we should mention as well are the little portable devices. So we have used portable fridges and freezers. Mm. Um, unless you by very expensive, heavily insulated units, they tend to be quite inefficient because they run almost continuously. Mm. And if they don't have good insulation, they're gonna, they're gonna lose all that coolness very quickly as well, especially where the ambient temperature like the tropics is quite hot. Mm. So um, they, they are very useful. They're especially useful as a backup, these little portable things. So if yeah, your main fridge goes down, then you can use your backup portable fridge. Yes, which is what we've done in the past. I would like a freezer. We we had that one free, that one freezer, but um, we didn't really have the power for it. Mm. And when we were about to power up um, in Malaysia, we left and it was too late to power up the batteries to, to, to run it. But a freezer is wonderful if you have the power for it. Yep. Um, okay, so you've got all your food on board. Now you've got a few tricks in how to prepare that food before you then put it in the fridge. You, you mentioned um, these delicate herbs like curry leaves, for example. Yeah. Um, you have a particular way in which you prepare those, don't you? Well, one thing I do with everything, every fresh piece of fr uh, fruit, vegetable and everything is I spray it first to get rid of bacteria and nasties, okay, not necessarily insects, but you want to spray it all with, um, with any solution that you can. I started doing this thoroughly during um, the crisis when we were all stuck indoors, just in case it was covered in some kind of virus. But you can use, you know, like a bleach water or hydrogen peroxide, anything you've got really. I put a few essential oils in there, spray it all off shake it off and then dry it in the sun catch it before it starts shriveling up in the sun and then store it um, some things then need to be in a in a in a kind of moist um, tea towel some in a dry tea towel but tea towels for me are crucial so i wrap everything either dry or or moist usually dry within a tea towel and then in a bag and then it goes in the fridge and i have found by doing that the tea towel then um, picks up the moisture from the whatever it is, and the bag keeps it reasonably tough, you know, in the fridge and stops it from bruising. And that's how I keep most of our fruit and veg. And I have to say, since Liz has been using the tea towel trick, this has really worked. Yeah. And, and things like, for example, just curry leaves off the yep. top of my head, which are quite delicate, uh, they last so much longer. Yeah. And, and we're putting them in the fridge as well. Yeah. Which 
sometimes pudding in the fridge will shorten the uh, shelf life of certain food foodstuffs. Yeah. So yeah, that trick is a very good one. Yeah. So really wrap. So it's really important to clean it first. It just stops some of the decay. Yeah. Um, that's the whole reason for doing it. They're the best thing for potatoes because potatoes are great but anything can set them off. And when they go bad, they really stink. Oh, it's the worst smell in yeah. the world, a rotten potato. It and really is. Don't put them in the fridge. They don't need to be in the fridge. They produce a kind of gas. So they need to be loose. They need to have air around them, but they need to, preferably for it to be cool air and dark air. Mm. So here, it was a matter of trying to find somewhere. Eventually I found a couple of years ago, under my desk, it never gets any light in there. It's the coolest spot on the boat, even when everything's closed up. So I got some kind of little hessian drawstring bags and started putting them in there. And it works wonders now. They last for a month, don't they? Don't go off. Do you like our coffee mugs? You can get your own from our shop. Find them at funnertheboat.com forward slash shop. By the way, when we store food on the boat, fresh food, we keep each item separate from another type. So yeah. you do not store onions with potatoes because that will set off that, yeah. that reaction yeah there's in something potatoes. exactly there's something about what they both emanate that is really bad for both of them so they both go off so we have the actually i have them hanging up in nets onions because they're one of the things that can survive very well in nets so they're up the very very front and then under the desk we've got potatoes and they are all harmonious yeah. It's all good. so that's dark spaces yeah. and, you, and you mentioned nets so yeah. we're not using nets so much well, you do use nets, I suppose, for things like, um, uh, I'm thinking citrus of fruits. Fruit. Yeah, citrus yes. fruits. I do tend to put all my citrus fruits together in one big net and hang that um, near the front. And that works quite well because I get through those fast anyway. And and also, again, keep citrus fruit away from other fruits like, yeah. like bananas, for example. Yeah, bananas need just to be on their own somewhere. Bananas need to be eaten within 24 hours because they <laughs> ripen so quickly. It's funny because people buy a great big bunch thinking, oh, these will last a couple of weeks, but they don't. They only all last together at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> don't buy too many bananas in one go. Or if you do, why buy a green bunch and a yellow bunch and then you might. Same with tomatoes, actually. We always try and buy some green tomatoes along with the red, so you get a whole variety of, mm. uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> perhaps the most common accessory for storing food, I suppose, on our boat are airtight containers. I mean, yeah. we've got airtight containers all over the boat. Yeah, we have um, in the galley above the sliding cabinet, there's a shelf, a brilliant shelf, all that runs the whole length of the galley with a very high fiddle, so there's masses of room there to put everything everything you want up there and everything up there is in its own container we know where they all are we can reach over and pick them all out so it's things that you use all the time like salt and pep I mean, pepper obviously and um, all your condiments all the different types of rices we have Cis Cere cereals, cereals well. all those sorts of things that you're using regular regularly are in front of you in airtight see-through containers all the teas the coffees stuff like that yeah, I think that's the other thing is that they're see-through, so you can actually mm. see what you're grabbing, so you don't put salt in your coffee. That's right. Yeah, I mean, you can get the ones that are not see-through, which I made the mistake of at one point, but now they're always see-through, so we can see what we've got there. Something that you've done a lot of is vacuum packing, vacuum yes. sealing, isn't it? So yeah. you actually bought a vacuum sealer, yeah. and that proved to be really good. If you get yeah. a good one that works well... Yeah, it reduces the space. So we we buy lots of nuts and stuff like that. So and seeds and so forth. And you get them in big containers, which are not going to last because they're going to get full of all kinds of things. So you put them into smaller bags and vacuum seal those. And that and the space just goes right down. And I put them all together in a cupboard and just open those bags as we need them. That is really good. Also good for the big cheeses. So we quite often buy big, big blocks of usually cheddar, massive like catering blocks. And then I'll slice them all up into reasonable sizes and vacuum seal those. And then they last for forever in the fridge. Mm -hmm. Once you open it, then they don't last for long. But that way, it's a good way of storing lots of cheese. We need yeah. to do that again, actually. I know uh, someone on our Discord channel mentioned another sailing channel had been injecting their vacuum pack bags with CO2. Oh, really? Because the CO2 is removing the oxygen, which, of course, is, is what is uh, shortening the shelf life of right. the foodstuffs. I mean, that sounds quite involved to me. But... Well, yes, I, I've not seen that. I've not tried it. Don't know how it works. But the whole point of vacuum packing is you're taking all the air out. So, mm. it sh you know, it should be OK. 
uh, certainly with seeds it's not a problem at all. I think with things that are a bit more delicate or maybe meat, which is something we don't have to worry about, so we can't really advise on that. Maybe it works better with meat. Who knows? No, but of course yeah. if you vacuum pack it and freeze it, that's it, it'll last forever. Yeah. Yeah, it's really good. One one thing I did forgot to say is that recently I've been buying these tiny little dehumidifier packets that you often, often get in food and various it's things that silicone, you buy. Silicone. Yeah, and I've been putting those in some of our containers just to stop any moisture that's in there as well because moisture is the big killer over here, the mould and the moisture. And that seems to be doing really well. Yeah. Well, another very traditional way of preserving food is to preserve them, mm. as as in pickling, making your jams, that, that kind of thing. Mm. Uh, we did do quite a bit of that in the past. Uh, I know I went through a phase of being obsessed with Branston pickle. And yep. was, I was trying to find the the secret recipe for Branston pickle and, and in Turkey I was actually doing a lot of preserving. Uh, you need vinegar, lots of vinegar for preserving. Yeah you tried lots of different recipes and you eventually were quite happy with the one you finally finalised. Uh, I think I found out that Branston pickle has dates in it. That's, that was it. That's dates. the secret yeah. ingredient was dates and then I started using figs because we had so many figs in Turkey. And of course, figs can go off quite quickly. So mm. by putting them in a preserve, it uh, right preserved the figs. I remember spending all day peeling tiny little onions to make pickled onions. Oh yeah. Do you remember it took me so long because each individual onion had to be had to take the skin off, and it yeah. took bloody hours and hours and hours. Then I pickled them, and they lasted about two days yeah. <laughs> because we just ate them all. They were so delicious. Oh. Yeah, so, so, so we've, we've done dried fish as well. So yeah. large uh, king kingfish mackerel, Spanish mackerel. I remember we preserved mm. that. Um, and I went through a phase of making my own lemon cordial by yeah, that was good. slicing lemon peel yeah. and leaving it in the sun soaked in sugar and it would make a lemon syrup. Yeah. So, yeah, there, I mean, there's so many recipes. If you've got there. a lot of time, you can have a lot of fun with this. Uh, preserving isn't something we've done a lot of, but you can, we know people who use their, what are those jars called? Oh, yes, I know. Yes, I know, the, I know what you mean. You know, uh, um, anyway, there's a certain kind of jar, especially for pickling, and you can fill the boat with those. Yeah. I, I think, you know, called. preserving is, is, you'll still see a lot of people doing it. It's not necessarily a hang up from days gone by because it is still a very useful way of preserving your foods. But I think as fridges have become more efficient, you know, we are able to keep a lot of our fresh fruit and veg uh, mm. longer as well. So It's worth having these up your sleeves for long trips, cross oceans perhaps, or in very remote areas for months at a time um, because electricity could go down. So if you've got stuff that's been preserved in some other way, and, uh, you know, you've got backup there. Do not underestimate fridges going down mm. at, the, at the worst moment. We have had our fridges cut out when you've just done a massive provision. Mm. And in fact, that's why we ended up buying an emergency portable yes. fridge was because our main fridge had gone down. I'm happy to say with our fridge system now, um, it really goes wrong, but I don't want to speak out of turn here, touch wood. <laughs> You've got a note here saying a word on eggs. Yeah, a word on eggs. Now, most people like eggs. I love eggs. Jamie doesn't. So we don't really have enough eggs on the boat. I do like an, like, I like an omelette. An omelette now and again. Yeah. So the th great thing about eggs is that they don't need to go into a fridge. They will be quite happily stored on their own if you regularly eating eggs. You can't really leave them out of the fridge for months at a time without them going off, but they are pretty good out of the fridge. Once you once they've been into a fridge, you can't take them out because you you kind of destroy that natural ability they have to preserve themselves. But we when we went across the the Indian Ocean, for instance, um, I had quite a lot of eggs. And what you do is you turn them every day. So you have them in a tray or in a container that allows you to turn it upside down, and that just stops the yolk from settling somewhere. Um, this is what we were, I was told. What I was told it was that's what I did, and it worked. And the other thing that some people did was uh, coat them in Vaseline as well. It helps to keep the the shell from um, allowing air in or re reacting in some way. Don't know if that's true, but we used Vaseline as well on our, our eggs, and they did last for weeks. So. If you can, don't put your eggs in the fridge. Free up some space in the fridge and find somewhere nice and neat and easy to keep them on the boat. So basically, don't leave all your eggs in one basket. Well, hey, <laughs> keep them up some, otherwise they'll boil. Right, we're, we're going to talk now about the exciting subject of yes. pests. Yes. <laughs> pests, which we, uh, unfortunately, as sailors, get on the boat frequently. Yeah. 
So, and I think the most obvious one is obviously cockroaches. And we hear people talking about not bringing cardboard on board the boat, yep. which is a tends to be a golden rule. So if you've done your shopping and you've brought your all your food back in a cardboard box, for example, do not bring it on board. It's because it may not have a cockroach in it. And you think, oh, it's fine. I can't see anything. You can't. It's the eggs in the cardboard that's the problem. It's the eggs that get sorted around your boat as you're, as you're undoing your whatever it is you've got in there so you'll see sailors all over the docks taking everything out of the packaging before they bring it onto the boat but really you shouldn't i mean some people go as far as removing all uh labeling on tin yeah. cans for example yeah. we don't go that far we've not no. really found that to be so much of a problem but but, um, but i am you know fixated on cockroaches because we've had them on and off over the years you usually get them when you're tying up along shore i mean it's more difficult to get them out but you can get them at any time particularly in this part of the world or anywhere tropical so i have anti-cockroach powder all over the boat just sprinkled very lightly along the tracks and in, in, in out of the way places in the bilges uh, and it does work so if you've got an infestation try the Try the anti-cockroach powder or just boracic acid. That works the same. Um, you, you said in the tracks. Yeah. Like what, what you mean is where you think the cockroaches yes. are walking. Yeah. So in a cupboard, for example, behind, if you open the cupboard door, mm. down in the corners, you know, the cockroaches could run along there. It's usually where you can't see. Yeah. So you just got to have a rough idea, but try and cover the whole boat in some way. But just you just sprinkle small amounts. I've seen boats where they, they put great heaps of the stuff cockroaches don't go on the big heaps you want them just to pick up a few bits as they're going around the boat and i leave it down year round it's there all the time as a you know so if anything does get on it's killed fairly quickly but if you've got an infestation you, you do this and you put a lot down you'll see lots you start seeing lots of dead cockroaches in two weeks time though the, the eggs that won't be affected by it will start hatching out and you may need to put more down so after a month, you should have cleared all of your cockroaches. Yeah, and top tip, collect the cockroaches, preserve them in a jar, and then <laughs> fry them up with a bit of coconut oil. They're very yeah. tasty. Uh, oh, yeah. No, don't do that. That was a joke. Okay, uh, the other horror that we have to contend with are weevils. Yes. Can you explain what weevils are? They sound like a little cartoon character. Yeah, they don't sound very nice, and they aren't very nice. If you look at them under the microscope or you Google them, W-E-E-V-I-L-S, you'll see all the different types of weevils that you can get. But they, you get them in flour is the obvious one and pasta, but they seem to live in anything, mm. any any kind of grain, anything. They just live there quite happily, hatching, reproducing, hatching more, reproducing. They won't kill you. They don't even spread disease. It's just not very nice having a mouthful well, of insects. Extra bit of protein, yeah. I suppose. But uh, London Barley on Discord uh, talked about freezing... Uh, mm -hmm. rice so we uh, were talking about say vacuum packing a bag of rice and chucking it in the freezer and they said it works on land i've cleaned my tiny stock of rice this way uh, the general consensus i think is at least three days maybe up to five days mm -hmm. so freeze uh, your rice and that will that will get rid of the weevils altogether they won't come back to life once it's de uh, defrosted yeah i mean when you say get rid of you mean kill them yes yeah okay so then you have to um sieve sieve them out mm. so that you're not eating them that's what i do sometimes if it's really absolutely infested i just chuck chuck the whole lot yep. if there's just one or two just a few in there then i'll sieve the flour whatever it is and then those weevils die over the edge uh if you miss a few i don't think it matters to be honest with you like i said it's a bit of protein yeah, yeah they, they, they won't kill you it's not like getting a cockroach no. or, or a rat in your food by the time you've cooked them up you can't see them um now you also use bay <laughs> leaves as well yeah this is a trick that's um, been around for many many years you put a bay leaf or two in your little pot of um well i put it pretty much in in most of our um, herbs and spices and things not you don't really need it in spices weevils don't like spices but they will go into your herbs they'll go into your seeds they'll go into your flour as I said so puts a few bay leaves in there they hate bay leaves mm. um bugs so you have a particular way and by bugs we just mean things that get picked up in the market 
Uh, bananas and pineapples are notorious for this. They'll pick up bugs that you can't see. So you tend to just spray them with a bleach yeah. solution. Yeah, I mean, as I said earlier, that's what I do with everything because the, there's things there that you can't see. Uh, pineapple's an interesting one. I always take the top off the pineapple mm. because inside that very beautiful leafy bit at the top, the crown, um, I've always, I'm always finding cockroaches. Lots of things hide in there. So they never come on the boat. Uh, rats. Oh, yeah. Get a cat. Get a cat for rats. We have discussed this before because I, I we got some criticism when we got a rat on board. Uh, people were questioning, well, how can you get a rat on board? Believe me, rats will get on board if they can. And that includes swimming and yeah. climbing up your anchor chain. They have been known to do that. We know a guy it happened to only recently. Uh, the best way to get rid of rat is to use one of these cages which is a long oblong cage that has a sprung loaded door and the best food to put in that cage is banana yeah so actually bananas are rotting don't need to fill don't need to cover it in peanut butter just a banana that's all you need and guaranteed the rat will go for this and he'll climb into the cage and you've trapped him and then it's up to you what you do with it after that uh, we know people that have used sticky um, you know, that sticky stuff, so mm. the rat climbs onto it. Well, that, I mean, that's a messy way of getting rid of rats. The cage is definitely definitely mm. the best way for me. Yeah, then you decide what you do with the rat once you've done that. But yeah, rats and boats have been together hand in hand for hundreds and hundreds of years. Sorry for interrupting, but while I've got you here, if you like what we do and you want to support us and become a Patreon or join us on FTB Mates or even drop a quid in the rum fund, go to followtheboat.com forward slash pub. Of course, come to the pub. You've bought your food, you've provisioned, you've got it on board, you've preserved it, you've stored it, now you're ready to cook it. Mm -hmm. So how are we going to do that? So the, the obvious source of power is going to be gas, mm. which is what most people use on board. Uh, the advantage, of course, is that it's uh, relatively clean and cheap, but it is a pain in the arse to source in remote places. Yes, and from country to country, the connections change, don't they? So it gets really difficult. <laughs> it is very difficult. They can be very difficult to refill. Um, and of course, they are. They, they can be dangerous as well. Mm. So you've got to make sure you have a proper sunlight cutoff uh, on your cylinders. You've got to make sure you have a gas detector on board, which is different to a domestic detector. So, uh, and the other thing as well with gas is that it heats up the boat. Um, yes. And creates lots of condensation. So yes. we uh, we switched to electricity. Yes, and one of the main reasons for me was the safety aspect. I just didn't want the boat exploding. Yeah, and of course because we have the lithium set up, mm. um, we've got free free power, free energy, and induction cookers are I would say are the closest thing to cooking on gas. Yeah. I mean, gas is the best way to cook, I think. Yeah. Uh, and elect electric stoves traditionally were nothing like cooking on gas, but an induction stoves are, are, are pretty good the way that they pulse. Um, so we're pretty much sold on that. Of the course, like we're talking about hob here. We're not talking about ovens and grills. This we're just true. talking about the hob. And so the other thing you have to consider is whether you want an oven or not. That's very true. It's That's a good point because uh, you could power an oven by electricity, but it would consume a lot of power, especially if you want to do baking. Mm. So, yeah, we decided to get rid of the oven altogether because we weren't doing that much cooking in the oven and we don't really miss it, to be honest. Not at all, because we, we've got lots of other gizmos that we'll go on to, but you've got a hob, you've got a grill and you've got an oven and just look at your lifestyle and what it is you're cooking. Uh, I find that I can cook everything on top of the stove. You know, I didn't need that oven, didn't want to use all that gas up, didn't want to get hot. So I just learned to do everything pretty much on top. And as you say, with induction, much less heat. Well, and also the induction stove is a lot cheaper than a than a um, marine stove. Mm. You know, these gimbaled cookers that are built specifically for boats can be very expensive. Thousands of pounds. Yep. And an induction two burner in the stove that we bought, I think, cost less than £100. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, another thing that we know some people have used, and we were asked about this, is solar. Yes. So little, little, or big, actually, solar ovens, uh, which are a great way of cooking if you have 
sunshine and heat. Do you have to cook outside with them though? Well, how are you going to get the sun to the mother? Yeah, exactly. So you've got to be doing all your cooking outside. So yes. that, I, to me, that's a pain because you've got all your preparation and everything and then lug it up and outside somewhere and then lug it all back down again and the washing up. For me, not an ideal thing. I think a nice, fun thing to have in addition to your main galley, but uh, for me, not, not a solution. Yeah, well, <laughs> it depends because there are so many different types of solar cookers. So we know a couple who had a very long solar oven which was designed to make french bread great that's my point if you want to do it for one particular thing great but they are used on you know ngos use these to help slow down deforestation so they encourage the locals to cook on solar so that they're not burning solid fuel but they're not on a boat they're not on a boat <laughs> no but you can get large-ish solar ovens but yes. i have to say actually as the wind picks up now as we're talking I can imagine having one of these things on your deck with a great big reflector, which is what they are, to capture that sun could be a bit uh, a bit dangerous to use. I think they're a great idea and I think they might work for some of the time, but I want a kitchen there where I've got my countertops all around me, I've got easy reach of everything and I can, um, I've got my knives and whatnot. Mm. I don't think it's ideal. What about solid fuel then? Yeah. So we've got things like, uh, you know, obviously wood, I think, is the main thing. Yeah. And, uh, well, it's free, isn't it? Again, wood is free, but you've got to go and, A, you've got to forage for it, and B, you've got to store it somewhere. And it's not always free. You might think it's free, but it does belong to somebody on somebody's land, I guess, doesn't it? Yeah, and it takes up <laughs> space. Yes. And, uh, and the hardware to actually burn this fuel is, is quite heavy as well. Isn't it's a it? lovely romantic idea. Uh, and I should imagine on some boats it probably works really well. Yeah. Wouldn't work for us. So looking at our galley then, what, what is it that we have that we find most useful? I mean, obviously we've got the hob. So in our yes, case, it, it's the yeah. induction uh, top. Now we used to have a grill when we had a gas oven. Yeah, so when we got rid of that stove, that's the thing I missed most was the grill. Mm. So the way it was set up is we had two uh, rings on the uh, left hand side and then on t on the right there was a hot plate and the hot plate sat over the grill and the, so you could be grilling something and keeping something nice and warm on the hot plate. Um, green t grilling toasted cheese sandwiches. Yes, we, we miss our toasted cheese sandwich. Yeah, and, and grilling, grilling stuff rather than frying it, so much better. Mm. I bought a griddle which I use on the induction hob but uh, yeah, I really miss the grill. Now David Johnson over on Discord, who's also one of our long supporters, hi David, he says, do you ever use your oven? It seems to me that the best use of an oven on a boat is as a Faraday cage. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> we used it more as a Faraday cage in the last 10 years or so than any other time, or the previous 10 years. Now, I mean, else. we know yachters <laughs> who couldn't live without their oven yeah. because they do a lot of baking. Yeah. So if you don't have a bread maker, which we do, uh, you will probably be using your oven to make bread, for example. There are alternative ways to make bread, but we do know people that couldn't live without an oven. Yes. But I think I was using it once a year to make a nut roast at Christmas. <laughs> and yes. that's about it. And I don't bake, really. Not interested in baking cakes and things. So, it, you know, it was quite useful now and again, but it wasn't an essential. So giving up that oven um, wasn't difficult. Not, not for us, no. but it, it will be for some people. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, David also goes on to ask about pressure cookers. Yes. And he says, I've seen a few sailors mention that they've used pressure cookers and they all love them. We use a pressure cooker at home on land. I consider it an essential kitchen gadget. His wife, who is ethnically Indian, says that the pressure cooker is up there with the rice maker. Totally agree. Yeah. It was, pressure cookers are, they're hundreds of years old. Yeah. And it was invented by a physicist, I looked into this, okay. called Denis Papin. <laughs> now, it was called Papin's Digester back in the 1600s, which was the 17th century here. Again, wow. And the idea is, is that the pressure creates uh, steam and steam is hotter than the boiling water. So it's cooking things quicker with the steam as opposed mm. to directly in the water. Mm. Which is great for vegetables. You're not swamping them with water, you're just steaming them and really quickly, which is good for power. The, that, as far as I can see, there are no downsides. We had a pressure cooker, we don't have one anymore. When we bought the induction, we only had an aluminium one, which wouldn't work. Yeah. So um, we never got around to changing it, which um, was a mistake. So uh, I 
we have cooked with a pressure cooker on a boat for years and we love it. Well, you say it's good for vegetables, but we know lots of meat eaters that pressure cooker their meat. Yes, yes. I mean, the, th the thing with pressure cookers is that pressure cooker food tastes absolutely yeah. delicious. And a little top tip for you, if you miss your baked potatoes, chuck in big potatoes in a pressure cooker. You won't get the crispy outside, mm -hmm. but the inside tastes just like a mm -hmm. baked potato. All the flavour stays there and yeah. all the goodness, all the vitamins and everything, it's all there. It's a very healthy way of cooking. It's great. It, it ticks every box, really. So, yes, definitely get one. And then another gizmo that a lot of yachties use that looks like a pressure cooker is a thermal cooker. Yeah, so the, the thing with this is you, you pre-cook it, you get everything ready, you get it into your thermal cooker and then you leave it in the thermal co cooker for a few hours. Of course, you're not using any gas or any power while you're doing this. So it's not on the stove, it's just you tuck it away in a wardrobe somewhere, let it cook away. Um, so it's a, like a vacuum flask, really, I suppose. It's just whole, it's retaining that That's essentially what it is. It's yeah. a vacuum flask. Slow cooker. Did you know they date back to medieval Europe, wow. thermal cooking? Again, it's been around for hundreds and hundreds of yeah. years. Um, and in fact, it was in Asia that they started to gain popularity more recently um, because a lot of Cantonese cooking requires slow braising. It's so, always the best for braising, isn't it, in mm. casseroles or anything. Long, long, long time to cook gives it most flavour. And the great thing is that you can have different chambers as well. Mm. So you can cook multiple foods all at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't stop all the prep and in the, in, the, in the initial cook. You can't cook from scratch. You need to put the thing in there at the temperature that it is required to be at. So for me, not much point in doing anything that you can quick, quickly cook. Doesn't gain anything. But for long term things like casseroles and, and curries, especially. Curries, you know how a curry tastes that. better sort of yeah. 12 or 24 hours after you've yeah. cooked it? In the thermal cooker, for me, a curry was yeah. just absolutely delicious. So you can do it, yeah. You can do, you do, you do your prep, put it in there in the morning when the sun's up high and they've got a whole day while the sun is rejuvenating your batteries and your food's cooking away using no power. Yeah. Barbecues. Um, yeah. Most, I think most long-term cruisers will have a barbecue on the back of their yeah. boat. It's a great way of getting rid of the heat from down below and actually cooking outside. You said about cooking outside. Well, that's where barbecue is very, you know, it's yes. good for that. Yes. Uh, gas or uh, solid fuel. Um, it's just a nice way of uh, keeping the heat off the boat completely. And of course, barbecue food, as we all know, tastes absolutely delicious. Yes, we'll barbecue a fish, uh, maybe a veggie burger, something like that. But for meat eaters, I think it's probably an essential. Did you know that liking and subscribing on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts helps us to get noticed? Go on, give us a helping hand. The other thing that you can cook on outside are the little portable gas stoves yeah. and you can pick these up for next to nothing and they use those little gas canisters which in Asia are everywhere mm. you can buy them anywhere and these tend to fold up and fold out and you can normally just put one pot on mm. so they're very useful if you're doing a potluck on the beach for example and you mm. need to heat something up uh, they're always useful to have one of those tucked away. We've got one somewhere tucked away on the boat. Yeah, and if we lose power, then we've got one ready to use if we yeah. needed it. Um, and we've also got a little mini induction hob as well, haven't we? That's right. I mean, that's mainly for backup in. on our induction. But, yeah. you know, the induction cookers are so cheap as well. So why not carry one on board if you've got the power for it? Yes. Now, I think perhaps our favourite investment <laughs> in the last couple of mm. years has to be the bread maker. Yeah, we need a bread maker. It's not a fad. It's something that we need because bread really from India onwards, so that was that's from 2010 onwards, um, has been rubbish. Absolutely horrible. Nobody knows how to make it outside uh, of Europe and, and Western countries. So <laughs> <laughs> India and the Far East and the Middle East and um, Southeast Asia, your bread is never very good. Well, hold on. We should just clarify this. Middle Eastern bread, flat bread. Oh, yeah, no, no. Flat bread is different. We're oh, talking, no, that's good. Stuff. We're talking loaves of bread and uh, maybe your sliced bread that you buy. They seem to love adding too much sugar to their bread here. So we make our own in a bread maker. And of course, if you have an oven, you could possibly be cooking it in the oven as well. But the bread maker, if you've got the power, is a game changer really is we have bread pretty much all the time um it doesn't take a great deal of power uh, it's on for quite a while so you've got to you know start it earlier in the day so that it's finished 
while there's still plenty of sun out there. You can do all kinds of different breads and ladle your bread full of lovely seeds and all kinds of things. And uh, you can use different flowers. Love it. It's essential. It is essential. Yeah. And as you say, it doesn't actually use that much power. No. It's rated at 450 watts. And a lot of the process of making the bread is it rising. So, like it's just, so it's not even on. It's only actually yeah. baking towards the end yeah. of the process. Most of it's just proofing it while it's sitting there. But then I think I would put almost right next to the bread maker, the rice cooker. Yes. Now this is an essential. Like we didn't really come across them coming <laughs> from Europe. But in Asia, every household has at least one rice cooker, no. some some more than one rice cooker. I'd learned to cook rice in a saucepan and was quite happy with it. And, and it was a bit of a faff, but I could do it and I could make rice quite nicely in a saucepan. But I don't know why. We decided as a friend of ours, Glyn, who said, oh, we can get these rice cookers just up here. You know, I've been using it. It's great. We thought, oh, I'll give it a go. Girl, we haven't looked back. Yeah, it's uh, it, it never fails to make top quality top rice. Top quality rice, what it does. And it does exactly what it does. And it says, and it's very quick. Put the rice in, put the water in, close it, turn it on. Done. Oh, love it. Another luxury item. We'll call them luxury items because <laughs> these do all require power. Yes. Uh, but since more and more of us are moving to lithium, you know, these are becoming uh, not quite necessities, but perfectly feasible to be using. But yes, another one with the Rob mentioned was an air fryer. Yeah. Now, we don't have any experience of using an air fryer, but I know pretty much every friend back home in the UK has an air fryer in their kitchen. Well, what's the advantage of an air fryer? It, less le, less it's, oil? It's using less oil. It's okay. supposed to be a more healthy more. way to, to fry. It sounds great. It sounds right up my street. Love the idea of it. But I haven't seen them for sale over here. Haven't? No, they don't seem to be as popular over here. They like to fry everything in deep vats. Yeah. <laughs> An inch of uh, coconut oil, but that, um, that's unfair. I'm sure they are used over here as well. But, yeah, we probably if we went to Bali or some of the, the bigger places, we could probably find them. Let's just quickly before we wrap up, um, Mrs. Teapot on <laughs> on Discord wanted any organisational tips that would maybe be relevant for larger families. Uh, my mind goes ah at the reduced worktop space and then goes blank. Well. Of course, we don't have experience of cooking for families, mm. um, but just a couple of quite obvious tips come to mind, I think, is to make sure all your washing up is done and your entire preparation area is clear of yeah. everything. So make sure you've got as much working space as possible. And my top tip would be to get all your ingredients out of the fridge at once. Mm. So all your your vegetables, your carrots, get all your onions, everything all ready uh, so that you're not constantly going back to the fridge and opening and closing it all the time. Yeah, that's how I cook. So I get the recipe out or in my head and I know what I need, do all the chopping, everything, have it all ready, rather like they do on TV chef programs, have yeah. it all ready in little bowls so that the actual cooking bit is easy. You've got it all ready. Da, 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 da. And I don't think much as it's for two people or a large family, it's just slightly larger portions of what you're going to do anyway um if that's what you mean by this question it is yeah uh, i agree ah there isn't enough space usually generally on a boat for preparing your meal so make another space somewhere use the table is the, is your galley close to the saloon is there a table there that you can use when i lived um down in sussex in a little, little country cottage the dining table was also the prep table um, so I don't see any reason why you can't do that on a boat. And we did mm. that in Turkey. I remember sitting at the table quite a lot, chopping chopping things up and getting ready. So use other areas in the boat to do your prep. Well, if you're cooking for a family, then I guess yeah. you have children. So get them. Get, get each of them, <laughs> one to prepare the onions, one to peel the potatoes. And as you say, I think it's to have all that prepared food then put in separate bowls yeah. so that you can then tip each one as and when you need it into yeah. whatever vessel you're cooking in. Yeah, we're talking about curries here, but I don't know what Mrs. Teapot cooks. You know, if she's doing loads of omelettes, it is a mess doing loads of omelettes. Maybe you need to steer the children into stuff that's easier for you to cook and prepare. Yeah. Well, I hope that helps. Uh, we should just quickly talk about water. Yeah. That is relevant as well. The obvious solution is a water maker. And I think you'll find most long term uh, offshore cruisers will have a water maker. For us, it's indispensable. Mm. And it means that you don't have to worry about uh, water consumption. But if you don't have a water maker, there's a, a few little tips. For example, when it comes to washing up, 
Uh, you should have a saltwater pump over your sink. You should also have a freshwater manual pump as an override in case your electricity goes down. Uh, but pump out loads of salt water onto your dirty plates and yes. rinse them. I do that all the time. I use it for rinsing everything first. You get all the nasties off so it mm. looks like it's been washed, but all it's had is a, a brush with some salt water. I use the salt water rin to rinse out the, the, the bucket and the, and the basin and then everything else, the sink. And then once you've done that, do your proper washing up. Yep. Uh, you can also use salt water for cooking. So I was introduced to this on the first boat I ever sailed yep. and the guy was cooking potatoes and he used salt water to cook the potatoes because mm -hmm. let's face it, when you're cooking things like potatoes, you often will add a little bit of salt to the water anyway. Yeah. And uh, so that's, you know, if you're not, un if you're a bit unsure about that, then maybe half and half, half salt, half fresh water. I think the salt water, if you're quite a way offshore, I think you're fine. Um, it's not going to be full of E. coli and all the stuff that the countries have been pu pumping out into our seas. It's going to be nice, clear, fresh water. But just remember that seawater is full of life that you can't see. So there, so, so there is stuff in there. <laughs> um, personally, I would boil my potatoes in fresh seawater. I wouldn't use fresh seawater for cooking close to shore because there could be all kinds of really yeah. nasty stuff in there. But for, for wiping up and clear, clear, clearing up, cleaning, initial clean, yeah, definitely. There's one last thing we should just quickly mention, and that is rotors and schedules oh, in yes. the galley. <laughs> uh, because if there's more than two of you on board, you're going to have to introduce some kind of rotor. And the only thing I'd say on this is the best rotor I ever was introduced to was when we did the Atlantic crossing with six of us. Mm -hmm. And the skipper decided that each day, one person, would prepare and cook and then whoever washed up both lunch and dinner so the idea was in the morning everyone got their own breakfast right and then at lunchtime the same person cooked lunch and they cooked dinner right so what about the washing up do they so do that as well they yes they they would tend to do the washing up although obviously if anyone else felt like helping they would but the advantage of this was that with six people on board you actually only have galley duties once every six days right okay Okay, I w uh, yes, but you would anyway, wouldn't you? Well, no, quite often one person would do lunch and then another person would do the washing oh, up right. and then a third person would cook dinner. Uh, so, so you did all the cooking that you, day? You did everything one day, so you had right. one hit and then you had literally five days off. Okay, so... You... Uh, and I really like that routine. Yes. But it's whatever A bit like my life. You. But I think it is important, I'll ignore that comment, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it is important to to come up with some kind of rotor, some kind of system, because if you're not careful, one person could end up doing everything and start to get a bit pissed off with it. Yeah, I think the important thing is when you're when you're cruising that you do share the load. I know quite often, uh, so in in some instances, the men never cook. This is what we've come across. Uh, you 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 cook. You like to cook, um, and they use the excuse that they do the engine well. You know, the trouble with cooking is that it's every day. And if you're doing something every day, sometimes you need a break. So if you're a man watching this and you never cook, just imagine cooking for your partner now and again. It just gives them a break. Um, and the same with clearing up and washing up, you know. So don't if you don't cook, then do all the washing up. If you don't do any of the cooking, then do all the washing up. Well, I think it's... All I'd say on that is I think it's whatever works. Yes. If... If your wife, in your example, mm. is happy to do all the cooking, then fine. But you never know, she might be getting a bit pissed off with it. Yes. So, yeah, vol volunteers do a bit of cooking. Yes. Okay, and finally, we just should address uh, Lundo Bali again mm. on Discord, wanted to know a little bit about trash management. Mm. And that's since that's related to the galley, I guess we should finish on this topic without yeah. getting too political yeah we'll just talk about galley trash management nothing else yeah so on our boat any biodegradable food stuff waste goes overboard it's as simple as that so potato peelings that kind of thing they go overboard yeah if it's organic it goes overboard. that will break down but lunda barley says i've recently learned that some sailors drop their cans in the ocean when ocean crossing uh, only ones that are not plastic mined uh, not plastic lined uh, I think most cans these days are plastic lined and we it's not something we do it anymore we used to but mm. 
for aluminium cans, which tend to have like a plastic print on them or a plastic lining, we don't put them overboard anymore. Instead, we crush them up mm. uh, so that they use the least amount of space as possible. Yes, I've read people say, you know, if you've, if you've got it on the boat in the first place to go across the ocean and you don't need to drop it over the side because you stored it originally. And that's a very good point. Just put the empty, clean, I mean, wash, wash it out so it's not full of organic stuff and it won't smell and just store everything until you get to land and then dispose of it. But of course, then that's another problem. It's, I mean, it is a contentious issue. So quite often we go ashore with our bag of rubbish mm. and, you know, we, we're expecting the locals to then deal with it. Mm. Invariably, that's either going to get burnt or that's going to end up on the seashore. And there have been a number of places where we've asked the locals where to put our bag of rubbish and they point to the shore. Yeah which is a place where the tide comes in and then washes it away. Yeah, so you do have to be very, very careful. And I think quite often you'll find yachts will end up uh, burning their rubbish on beaches. Um, it's the lesser of two evils, I think, because it's either that or it ends up back in the water and breaks down as microplastics. Obviously, in an ideal world, we want to know that our rubbish is all being incinerated at safe and high temperatures, but it just doesn't work like that. So I think the important thing is just to ask the local people, where do they put their rubbish? And uh, to make sure it doesn't end up back on the beach. And if, if you're worried that it will, then hold on to it until you find somewhere where you can dispose of it. I mean, it's amazing. We can, we can travel for weeks carrying our own rubbish until we get to a place where we know it's gonna be yeah. disposed of more responsibly. Yeah. And the other little tip we've got is, um, if you've got a big two liter, an uh, empty plastic container, like a squash container, that makes useful storage for all your other bits of plastic. So you can cut up the other bits of plastic or squish down plastic bags and stuff them into the two litre bottle. You can really force a lot of plastic into those bottles and they're really easy then to store. Yep. Um, as, again, make sure you wash it first. You don't want any organic stuff in there. You just want to neat plastic all stored and squidged in together. It's the same with the plastic bags you know, of rubbish, really pulverise it right down in there. And there's a lot you can keep hold of. It's amazing, yeah. Right, Ooh, that was, uh, <laughs> I, I think we're done there. That, that was a big one. There was a lot of information in there. Yes. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there with their own tips yes. and advice, in which case, pop them in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, we're bound to have left stuff out and it's all good for all of us to know your comments and your ideas. Yep. Right, that's it. So what are we doing now? I'm going to have a lie down. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to do a washing.